Okay, so good morning. Um, I'm a cosmologist and I'm not a philosopher, so uh, I'm not going to try to pretend to be. Um, but I thought I would uh, tell you about how we analyze data in, uh, uh, in cosmology and some of the issues that we have to deal with, I think, perhaps do stray into the, into the area of, uh, of philosophy. Um, astronomy is a, an unusual science, of course, in that we, we can't make repeated experiments necessarily. Uh, we have one universe that we can observe, and uh, that puts some constraints on how we can uh, do the science. And uh, um, in some circumstances, there is a fundamental limitation, which is that we only have one universe to observe, uh, and that can put a, a, a limit on how much we can uh, we, we can learn. Um, one of the trends in cosmology in recent years, or the last perhaps 20 years or so, has been uh, an increase in the use of uh, Bayesian thinking to the extent that it really is the norm. Uh, and uh, it's quite unusual to see analysis uh, these days which is, uh, which is not Bayesian. Um, so I wanted to give a, a, an overview of how we, how we do the science in this way and some of the challenges that we, that we come up against. Uh, the sort of data that we're looking at is usually large-scale data if we're going to try to infer things about the cosmos, uh, which could be the distribution of galaxies, uh, or we could look right back towards the Big Bang and look at the light that's left over from the Big Bang in the form of the microwave background radiation. Uh, much of what I'm going to say is not particularly uh, unique to this particular type of observation, um, but uh, some, of it, uh, some of it is. Um, there's a couple of things that we can try to do. We can simply try to characterize the distributions that we look at, uh, simply trying to look at their statistical properties and uh, uh, outline them. Um, but most of what we do is to try to learn from the observations in the context of a theoretical model. So we try to infer something about this, uh, a physical model uh, of, uh, of, the, of the universe. So I'm going to focus uh, almost entirely on this second aspect rather than just a, simply uh, a characterization of the, uh, of the data. I think it, within astronomy, in a sense, we're quite lucky uh, that we do have what we think are good physical models for the data that we're collecting, um, particularly on large scales. Uh, on smaller scales, things get uh, more complicated because of um, different physical processes that are involved. But on large scales, it's basically gravity that rules. Um, so we, have, we think we understand the physical processes that connect the theory to, uh, to the observations. And the standard model that we uh, interpret the results in normally is, the, is based on Einstein's general theory of relativity. Uh, it's the Big Bang model that assumes uh, a very symmetric universe, one which is homogeneous and isotropic, uh, ruled essentially by gravity. And uh, the physical model has a, a small number of tunable parameters in it. Uh, these are the amount of uh, ordinary matter, the amount of dark matter, the amount of this mysterious stuff called dark energy, uh, and the expansion rate of the universe. So these are, you can, uh, the, the Big Bang model can be um, envisaged with uh, different amounts of these things, and uh, one of the major goals of, uh, of cosmology is to uh, determine what these uh, parameters of the universe are. Uh, so it, we're in a lucky position, I would say, in that um, we're not having to develop new models to try to understand the data. We are principally working with a single model where we're trying to infer the parameters. That's not to say people don't uh, look at different models and uh, investigate different models of the universe. Of course they do, but we do have this standard model that allows us to connect theory and uh, observation in a relatively direct way. Um, and this situation means that uh, the study is a, is, is a fertile ground for application of the scientific method. We can confront uh, theories with, uh, with, with data. Uh, and there are essentially two types of problem that we, that we try. One is parameter inference. So we try to infer the parameters uh, of a single model. In other words, the amount of dark matter and so on. 
in the Big Bang model. Uh, but we also do explore whether the Big Bang model is favored over, over other models. I'm not going to talk very much about the comparison between mo uh, uh, different models. That's a higher level question of uh, is the Big Bang model favored over the steady state theory, for example, or some more exotic model where uh, Einstein's gravity is not, uh, is not the controlling force. Um, so we also do this. This is a more challenging uh, computational task to look at model comparison. I can talk about it later uh, if you like, but I'm going to focus mostly on parameter inference. So here we're assuming that the model that we interpret the data within is the correct model, and we, we try to uh, infer the, uh, the parameters within it. I've used the word inference rather than uh, estimation. It's often called parameter estimation, but that doesn't really quite describe what we try to do, because the goal here is not to get an estimate, which would be a single number typically, um, but our goal is to get a, a full probability distribution for the unknown quantities in the, in, in, in the model. Um, and the focus of my talk will be essentially on how we get this probability distribution. So we want a, uh, uh, a, the, the probability of uh, the dark matter density being some particular value, for example. We're not trying to get a, a single point estimate of the, uh, uh, of the dark energy, dark matter uh, quantities. Uh, so this is the sort of typical output from a, uh, an analysis of a survey. Uh, we'll have some model which has some number of parameters in it, in this case four. It doesn't really matter what this, what this uh, uh, model is or what the data are. Um, but we will get uh, contours of probability for all four parameters, in fact a joint distribution of all four uh, parameters of the model. Uh, and we can uh, integrate over three of them and get distributions for each of the four parameters if we, if we, if we want to. But the, the natural outcome of a Bayesian analysis of, of, of a problem like this is a four-dimensional probability distribution for the four parameters in the model. So the way that we approach it is um, through uh, a Bayesian analysis. So I've got a, one extremely introductory slide, just uh, uh, in case anybody's not come across this before, but I'm sure uh, everybody has. Um, that we, are, we apply Bayes' theorem, which uh, results from the usual rules of probability, that the joint distribution of, P, uh, of A and B can be written as the probability of A given B times the probability of B, but we can reverse uh, A and B and write it as the probability of B given A times the probability of A. Uh, and then if you divide one by the other, you get Bayes' theorem. Uh, so I'm sure everybody's seen this before. Um, and nobody disputes this, and um, people who don't use Bayesian data analysis would not, not uh, argue with this. Um, but uh, the way that we use it is uh, something which is um, not so... Uh, uh, which um, is, has been controversial in the past. I would say in cosmology, uh, less so now, uh, and probably not, not at all. Um, so the interpretation that we make of the probability is that it's a state of knowledge, and uh, we would, in this case, take B to be the parameters of the model, and A to be the, the, the data. So then... Uh, Bayes' theorem then uh, reads like this, that the thing on the left is called the posterior. In fact, let me just uh, put the, all, the, all the elements in here um, straight away. Uh, the thing on the left is the thing that we're, we're seeking. Uh, and it seems closest to the, the outcome that we would, we would like. We've got some data. We learn something about the parameters. What we want is the probability distribution for those param parameter values uh, given the data. Um, so I'm using Jeffrey's notation of the vertical bar meaning given. Uh, so we can use Bayes' theorem to turn this around and write it in terms of the probability of the data given the parameters, uh, which is the likelihood, uh, times the probability of the parameters, which is the prior. And then the term on the bottom simply normalizes the probability uh, in this case. It's called the evidence. This, this object plays a role when we do model comparison. Um, all of these 
probabilities are conditional on the, on the model. So if you do this for two different models, you have two different uh, probability of the data given the model becomes a, uh, an interesting quantity for model comparison. How likely is it that you can get that particular uh, set of data within the context of different models? And that plays a, a very important role in model comparison. But as, as I say, I won't, I won't dwell on that. If we're talking about inferring parameters, then the relative probability of two parameters uh, would mean taking the ratio of, of uh, two of these probabilities, and in this case, the, the evidence just cancels out, so it plays no role. <clears throat> so our posterior probability depends on two things. One is what's the probability of getting the data that you have, given any uh, arbitrary parameters within the model, uh, times a prior. Um, so that's your prior knowledge of the, uh, of the parameters. And the way that uh, we tend to think about this is that when we collect new data, then we, we update our state of knowledge. So before we've taken the knowledge, uh, we've taken the data, we have some idea of what the parameters are, so we may have some uh, uh, prior knowledge, prior probability distributions for the, for the ranges of, uh, of the parameters. Uh, and then once we collect new data, then uh, the likelihood then modifies that prior uh, to form the posterior, and this then reflects our new state of knowledge having, uh, having collected uh, uh, extra data. And then we can repeat the process if we, could, if, we, um, uh, if we collect more data. <coughs> I should say, as I just alluded to, all of these probabilities uh, assume a, a particular model and also any, any prior information, but I'm not I'm leaving these things out. <coughs> So let me give you an example um, of, uh, uh, of this. So this is the state of knowledge in the late 1990s about the amount of dark matter in the universe, or total matter in fact here, and the total amount of dark energies uh, in the universe. And uh, if you look at the blue contours, that uh, essentially encapsulated our state of knowledge of these two parameters in the model uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, we live somewhere in there probably. Uh, with a, very small probability of being outside this blue region. But then if we take the situation after the Planck experiment, uh, which looked at the microwave background radiation in much more detail, then uh, these posterior contours are then uh, restricted to this range up here. Uh, so we claim that we've learned something in those intervening uh, 20 years. Let me just say, have one slide on model comparison to just say that we, we, we can generalize this general approach to uh, ask higher level questions, uh, such as whether the Big Bang model is uh, favored over, over others. Uh, and there, the, the object that we're looking for is not the probability of the parameters given the data, but what's the probability of the model given the data. And that involves usually some very large multi-dimensional integrals over the parameters of the model, so it tends to be a rather expensive thing to do, but it's now becoming possible to do it with uh, new numerical techniques. Um, one of the things that we can't do is to get uh, absolute probabilities of models. Um, what we can do is to take two or more models and get relative probabilities given the data. Uh, we can't make a statement about whether a model is correct or not, um, it, it may be extremely unlikely, but if it's the only one we've got, then uh, that's, uh, we, we can't uh, uh, rule it out. One of the assumptions <coughs> in Bayesian analysis is that in the parameter inference problem, the assumption is that the model is a good description of the data, the correct description. If we do model comparison between different models, then we have an assumption that one of our models is the correct one. So if we have, say, four competing models, uh, if we can work out their relative probabilities, and uh, we may conclude that uh, the probability of one of them is, is uh, 0.9, for example. Uh, but that uh, depends on the assumption that one of those four models is correct. That may not be, that may not be right. <clears throat> um, let me just say that uh, in, the, in, the, in Bayes' theorem there we had the posterior on one side and the likelihood on the other, um, which involved uh, changing the order of the uh, quantities. Um, and uh, 
I think many of the mistakes that have been made in the past have been confusing these two, um, that P of A given B is not P of B given A. So for an example, probability of having a beard if you're male is about 0.1. That's, that's probably a little bit higher in this room. Okay, so, but if we reverse them, what's the probability of being male given that you have a beard? Well, it's not 0.1, approximately 1. Uh, so here, I should say this is not Julia Mar Margaret Cameron, this is, this is Charles Darwin, but she took the, uh, uh, the image. Okay. <clears throat> so very often the mistakes that, that we make are that uh, we calculate the probability of the data given the model, and we find that it's very small, and then we say that the model is wrong. But that's not the right conclusion because the probability of the data given the model is not the same as the probability of the model uh, given the data. Okay, so let me just um, uh, just to orient you, tell you about some of the sorts of data that I'm going to talk about. Uh, in the top left is the light that's left over from the Big Bang, the so-called cosmic microwave background radiation. This is a very nice data set to work with because it comes from the uh, early universe when the universe was very simple uh, before all of this uh, stuff had existed so it was much simpler than it is today. Um, so we get a very nice statistical analysis problem because we understand a lot about the statistical properties of this, uh, of this field. Um, but we also need more information that comes from uh, the present day distribution in the case of the top left, we're, we're looking back to something like three or four hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Uh, so we're looking back to the very early universe, whereas here, uh, the present day observations are when the universe is uh, something like 13 billion years old, uh, where things have got a lot more complicated, but there's extra information that we can get out of these. Um, both from the distribution of galaxies, how matter has clumped over time, uh, and also through gravitational lensing, you can probably see some very uh, elongated images here that have been bent by, by gravity. And that tells us about the matter distribution in the universe and gives us more information. Um, so let me just say a little bit more about the, uh, the terms in this uh, uh, equation. Um, so here's Bayes' theorem. I've, rather than writing parameters all the time, I've, uh, written theta and uh, d for the data. Uh, if we look at the likelihood term, the probability of the data given the parameters, um, this is something which theoretically we might be able to predict or calculate. Uh, and it's referred to as the sampling distribution if we regard this as a function of the data. So if we were to simulate a universe with given fixed parameters and uh, do many simulations, we could uh, uh, get probabilities of getting any set of data. It won't be the same every time. So that's uh, called the sampling distribution if regarded as a function of, of, of data. Um, but the way that we use it is not in that form. Uh, it's the same expression, um, but we call it the likelihood. And the interpretation of that second term uh, is that the data should be regarded as fixed. The data are what we have, That's, uh, those are the numbers that we've uh, collected. Uh, so D is fixed and we regard that likelihood term as a function of the parameters for fixed data. So it's the same expression but it's, uh, the interpretation is different. Uh, and in the context of doing parameter inference you can see that that's what, that's, uh, that's what we want. Uh, given the set of data, what's the probability of the parameters? So we want this whole thing as a function of theta and not as a function of that. Data. So the challenges that we face, there are, there are several. One is that uh, the data may be very high dimensional. We may have a very large number of data. Um, and this likelihood function may not be easy to write down. In some circumstances, the central limit theorem will help us, and we can write this as a Gaussian distribution, multivariate Gaussian distribution, but it may not be. Um, okay, so that's, that's a challenge either of, uh, of theory, of not being able to uh, write down the likelihood in a, in a simple way, um, or a computational one, um, but not a particularly conceptual one. Um, 
The other term on the top there is the prior, which was controversial in the last century, uh, particularly. Um, what I said before was that every time you get some data, then you update your state of knowledge, so you can just keep on doing this every time you get some new data. But uh, if you go back to the very first experiment that, uh, that you do, then what do you put for the prior before you have any data? Uh, so that's an interesting problem. Um, and uh, what do we do? Well, what we try to do is to choose priors which are uninformative so that what we infer about the parameters is driven by the data that we've collected and not by our prior assumptions. The difficulty is that uninformative is um, something that's not straightforward to, uh, to consider, especially in high dimensions. And I'll give you an example uh, where one's intuition fails quite badly uh, in, in high dimensions. Um, so we tend to, what we tend to do is to, do, is to assume, say, uniform priors. We just assign uh, a uniform probability to all values of the parameters of the, of the parameter. Uh, before we have any data. We say that they're all equally likely, but that's not necessarily uh, and obviously the best thing to do. Um, there is a school of thought which I'll say a little bit about, uh, which is to try to choose this prior in a, objectively uh, a, 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 to be as least, as, have a, as little information in it as possible. And I'll say something about that in a moment. Fortunately, if you have enough data, uh, then the prior becomes less and less important as you collect more and more data. So eventually, you don't care what the prior was, uh, and, the, uh, and the likelihood basically drives, uh, drives everything. Uh, in cosmology, we're not necessarily in that, situ that situation, because we have a limited amounts of, uh, of data, uh, and we may never be able to get enough data such that the likelihood is dominant. So let me give you uh, one of the challenges of, uh, of defining a, a prior. Let's imagine that we have a, a, uh, a system where we have uh, two parameters uh, which we can plot, plot on the graph here. So the prior, if the prior range is that square, <clears throat> so we just say that the parameters have to be somewhere between these two, these two limits, then one might be tempted to say, well, the prior probability that's least informative is just to say everywhere in this square is equally likely. Seems perfectly reasonable. But then let's ask the question, how much of that probability is within the circle that just touches the sides? And in two dimensions, that's about uh, 79%. Um, if we have a three-parameter system, and we say that each parameter is equally likely, and we ask the question, what's the probability that the parameters lie within the uh, the, the uh, sphere that just sits inside there, then it goes down to 52%. If we do this in more and more dimensions and add more and more priors, then the probability that the parameters lie inside the N ball or S ball that sits inside this uh, S cube uh, looks like this. So as a function of the dimensions, if we go up to 100 dimensions here, uh, the probability of um, being inside the uh, s-dimensional ball that sits just inside it goes down to 10 to the minus 70. Okay. So essentially all of the probability then is right in the corners. Um, so if you were to say, uh, rather than saying, let's put a uniform prior on, on each of these parameters uh, individually, if you wanted to say, um, let's put a prior on the on the distance of these parameters from, from the origin, you get a very different result. If you had a uniform distribution uh, as a function of uh, the distance uh, from the origin, then uh, you get a, uh, a, a completely different result. So in very high dimensions, priors that sound uninformative and reasonable um, actually turn out to be extremely strong priors. It means that all of your probability, virtually all of your probability is here, 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 and here. So it's very informative, that prior. Okay, so there is, a, um, uh, there is another approach that can be taken, um, and I've done a little bit of work on this uh, 
It's not something that we normally do, but you can ask the question, uh, can I choose a prior such that the information gain in going from the prior to the posterior is as great as possible? Um, and you can do that, uh, and the way that it can be done is to maximize the mutual information between the prior here and uh, the, the data set. In fact, it, it seems that one can do this analytically only in the, uh, in the uh, limit of taking uh, many repetitions of the data set. So this is what's, uh, uh, what you could learn by, um, um, by, by, by doing the experiment many times. Um, so, but conceptually what this is doing is trying to uh, maximize the information gain going from the prior uh, to the posterior. Um, and in that sense, making the prior as least informative as possible. Anything else would mean that the information gain was, was smaller, uh, so that we've, uh, uh, we've um, uh, but by doing this, we've learned as much as we possibly can from the data uh, compared with the prior. Uh, so you can do this mathematically by using the, the mutual information. The uh, stuff inside the brackets here is the callback Leibler divergence between the prior and the posterior. So if you make this object as big as possible, then from an information theory perspective, uh, this is giving you the biggest information gain between the, uh, the prior and the, uh, and the posterior. And the other integral is uh, to, because we can do this before we do the experiment, so, we, so the data are random objects, so this basically also uh, uh, integrates over the possible, the possible data that you might collect. So in, a, in some sense, it's a sort of average information gain. Uh, you maximize the average information gain in going from the posterior, the prior to the posterior. <coughs> so if you can do this, then you can, uh, you can maximize this so-called missing information, uh, or the information gain, and, that, and use that to define your, uh, your least informative prior. So the advantage of this approach is that the knowledge that you've gained has come as far as possible, has come from the data that you've collected and not from the prior. Um, the disadvantage is that then the prior depends on the experiment and it goes away from the way that we normally use Bayes' theorem, which is to say, okay, we'll, we'll define our prior to start with before we've done anything without thinking about the data that, we've, uh, that we're about to collect uh, and, and, and describe the state of knowledge as it is. With this objective, so-called objective Bayesian approach, then uh, the prior that we choose depends on the experiment that we're about to, uh, to, 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 to undertake. Um, so whether, that, whether you think that that's uh, a, a reasonable thing to do or not, this is something which is, uh, which is debated. In one dimension, this uh, ends up being a thing called the Jeffreys prior, which I won't go into, but in more than one dimension, it's actually not always the case that you can, uh, uh, you can define this uniquely. But let me just give you an, uh, an example of, uh, of applying this. Uh, one of the things that we can learn from cosmological data is the masses of the neutrinos. And depending on which sort of prior you choose, then you can get uh, rather different results. So if we choose, uh, we were able to find the objective prior for this situation for neutrino experiments. Uh, and we could get posterior distributions for the three species of neutrino that look like this. And an alternative um, subjective prior, which was chosen to be uninformative, although we disagree with the fact that it's uninformative, uh, gives you an answer like this. Um, so you'll see that the lowest mass neutrino, the most likely value gets uh, shifted significantly to the right. Uh, the probability of the low, lowest mass neutrino being close to zero uh, goes, goes down quite significantly. Uh, and these generally get broadened towards the, uh, towards the right hand side. So this is a, a typical situation in cosmology where we, we really don't have quite enough data to give definitive answers to this question yet. So our current state of knowledge is determined partly by the data that we do have and also partly by the prior. Um, and uh, that, as I say, is a, is a, typical, a typical situation. Um, let me go on, perhaps I have to speed up a little bit and talk about um, some of the some of the challenges of uh, uh, because of the amount of data that we have. Um, 
So, so that was uh, what I was talking about there was at, at a more conceptual level. This is more in terms of uh, practical, uh, practical issues. Uh, this is the Planck microwave background map, or the best map of the microwave background sky, uh, showing the fluctuations in the temperature due to quantum fluctuations in the universe. There's something like, I think, 50 million pixels here, so the data set is reasonably large. Um, and handling data like that to do the inference uh, can be challenging. Um, so what we try to do is to compress the data. And compressing data is very easy. Uh, you can just throw some of it away. <laughs> but that's not necessarily a very good thing to do because you lose information. Um, however, there are circumstances when you can, um, you can uh, compress the data without losing uh, information. So... Uh, in fact, although I said that the number of pixels was something like 50 million, the data that's actually collected, the numbers that are collected, are the time-ordered data that come from the telescope that's uh, been spinning uh, in space. Uh, so it views the universe many, many times and collects data in a time-ordered stream. Uh, and that's something like 10 to the 12 numbers. Uh, but clearly, because it's seeing the same patch of sky, many, many times over, you can compress that data. The CMB sky is essentially not changing with time. So uh, a simple way to do things would just be to, in a particular pixel, would be to, to average all of the, uh, the observations in, uh, uh, in a, uh, uh, the, 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 that hit that pixel. That's not necessarily the best thing to do, but it's, uh, it's uh, almost optimal. Um, so you can certainly reduce the time order data down to uh, a map, which will have a, the order of 10 to the 8 numbers in it. Uh, but in fact, because of the statistical properties of the field, it's a virtually a, a perfect Gaussian random field. Uh, it means that we can characterize the distribution by its two-point statistics. This is the power spectrum of the, uh, 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 of the data with the theoretical model um, with its best fitting parameters uh, uh, superimposed. And this is perhaps the reason why I say that we have a standard cosmological model that we, we think works quite well. This is the, the, the data and the theory uh, match extremely well um, with uh, around about a thousand numbers. And once we've got that, then well, it's done in a slightly different way. We can then infer the cosmological parameters from uh, a variant of this compressed data set. So we're working only with the order of a few thousand numbers rather than uh, the, the whole map. So one can do that. That's not necessarily the best thing uh, to do. Uh, here's another example. This is the previous experiment called WMAP. Slightly lower resolution, done slightly earlier. Uh, and this is another statistic that was used, uh, uh, not really used very much in, in anger, but rather than plotting the power spectrum, so this power spectrum essentially gives you the amplitude of waves of different wavelengths on the sky. So you can see that there's uh, there's a large scale component, some very large long wavelength modes here, but there's also small scale modeling here, and that small scale modeling is, is here. So there's a, there's a, a big um, uh, amplitude of uh, fluctuations on a scale of a few millimeters on this, uh, on this plot. Um, WMAP used, looked at a different statistic, which is the correlation of the temperatures. So if, you, if you're sitting on a point that's a slightly higher than average temperature and you move only a small distance away from it, then you'll, the temperature is likely to be high. Um, as you can see here, these hot spots, if you move only a millimeter, the temperature is likely to be high. But if you move a couple of centimeters away, if you're in a high region, then the temperature is likely to be colder a couple of centimeters away. So the temperatures become temperature fluctuations become anti-correlated, which is what you see here in the black line, uh, black line here. So the black line uh, is the data, are the data. Uh, our best fitting cosmological model is the green one here, and you can see there's re very good agreement between the theory here and the data here. So we're quite happy. Uh, trust me, that green line is the best fitting parameter for those data. So why does this look so weird? Well, the reason is that unlike the power spectrum that I showed you before, where the points 
uh, move up and down independently. So you can basically do a fit by eye. Here, these points, these data points are very highly correlated. So it's actually quite easy just by changing the amplitude of the long wavelength fluctuations. And those are rather, they're not very well specified by theory. They can move around quite a lot within the theoretical model. If you change the large scale amplitude, you can move all of these points up and down together. So you need to take into account the statistical properties of the data. They're highly correlated. Uh, so that green line is, despite what it looks like by eye, uh, is um, the, sorry, the probability, if this is the true expected correlation function, the probability of getting this set of data points is very high, despite appearances. And you really have to understand the statistics uh, to convince yourself of that. You cannot see it by eye. As I say, using this, these statistics is much, much more sensible because these, these points are basically uncorrelated and you can, uh, uh, you can do things. So, uh, let me think. How am I doing for time? I should probably wrap up, shouldn't I? We start at 10 minutes late, so if you have any more questions. Okay. Um, let me just say what the latest things that we're doing are. Um, what I've described here are so-called summary statistics, where we've taken the whole data set and compressed it down to a, a, a much smaller set of, uh, of statistics, whose uh, statistical properties we need to know. So let me just skip a little bit of this and just uh, say what we try to do now, which is much more ambitious, which is to avoid using summary statistics, um, partly because, in general, they're they're lossy, they will lose information, uh, and partly because it's not always easy to, uh, to know what their sampling distribution is. So we need to know the probability, uh, joint probability of all of those statistics, and that may be difficult to, to get. Uh, so what we now try to do is to do things called uh, Bayesian hierarchical models, where we build a full model of the data. And uh, one advantage is that we can use all of the information and not use, not just what's contained in the summary statistics. So let me give you a simplified example, um, uh, which we use for weak gravitational lensing. Uh, we build a probabilistic model where we have, for example, a prior on the, I've written it as C here, which is the power spectrum, but you can read that as the prob prior probability on the cosmological parameters. Um, if we set the cosmological parameters, that sets the statistical properties of the map, but doesn't say what the map has to look like. The map is a random realization of that of, uh, of, um, due to the quantum fluctuations. So what we can do is to work out, uh, is to generate a map, a random map with the same statistical properties. So S here is the map, um, and that map is conditional on the statistical properties set by the, uh, the cosmological parameters. Uh, once we've got the true map, then um, our observations are noisy for various reasons. So we add some noise to those observations, some errors, and we get uh, then a probability distribution for the data that we observe, given the true map, S, and given the noise properties of the, of the experiment. And that allows us to, to get to the data. So this would be a simple generative model that goes from theory at the top with its priors to the observational data. Uh, now, what we want to do is to go backwards up this chain, this is what we see, and we want to get a posterior probability for the, um, for the parameters uh, of, um, of the model. So, let me just sketch how this works. Um, so, the, the goal is the posterior, the probability of the parameters. Um, so, if you prefer, replace the C by theta up at the top. Um, and what we do is to introduce latent variables, which are the map. The, the, essentially the map, the true map, which we don't observe. We only observe the, the noisy version of the map. Um, and for gravitational lensing, this will be a thing called the shear map. And then we can write, using the laws of probability, the probability, the posterior probability for the parameters given the data is the integral over all possible maps of the joint probability of the map of the parameters given the data. Uh, so that's so far fine. Uh, we can use Bayes' theorem to reverse the order of these things either side of the vertical line um, and write it in terms of a likelihood term and a prior on the map and the parameters. 
which we can then split up using laws of probability again. We can write this joint distribution as the probability of the map given the parameters times the prior of the parameters. So the nice thing about this is that uh, this object, which is a complicated object in total, splits up into a number of discrete components, um, all of which we would hope to be able to calculate. Um, so this first term, the probability of the data given the true map, actually doesn't depend on the parameters, this is just measurement noise, uh, another source of noise which I won't bother with, um, but, but this is to do with the, uh, the measurement noise essentially. This part here, what's the probability of getting a particular map given the parameters, that's where the theory comes in. So the physical theory is in red, and then we have, as usual, ultimately a prior on the, on the parameters. So I say the nice thing about this is that it splits up into probabilities, conditional probabilities that we, uh, we think we understand. Uh, why is it hard? Um, writing it down mathematically is fine, but we have to integrate over all possible maps. <laughs> right. Now, a map might consist of, in the case of the microwave background, 50 million pixels. So that map is a 50, dimension, 50 million dimensional space um, that we need to, to integrate over. If you take each, the value of the temperature in each, in each pixel as being a coordinate, if you like, uh, it's, a, it's a very high dimensional space, typically of the order of a million uh, or so. So we have to sample and integrate over this uh, extremely high dimensional space. Uh, and that's challenging, but there are methods that can be used and have been used successfully. Uh, so-called ha Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling, or sometimes you can use Gibbs sampling to, to sample this, uh, this space. So this is uh, just some simulated data that we did for, uh, for weak lensing. So just to talk you through it, forget that there are two lines here, just look at the, look at the top row. Uh, so this is a computer-generated map of the lensing distortion pattern. Um, uh, we add some noise to it. Uh, we also have parts of the sky that we can't see because there are bright stars in the way. So we mask it out, in this case, with some simple circles. Uh, and then uh, we run, a, in this case, a Gibbs sampler to work out the um, possible maps that are consistent with the data and possible cosmologies. So the movie here shows you all the possible maps that are, not all of them, but uh, samples of the possible maps that are consistent with the, uh, with the data. And as you can see, because it's noisy, those, sample, those true sample maps don't correspond exactly with the simulated map, but there are some features which are, which are pretty common, such as the, this point here, say, being um, fairly consistently uh, uh, red. So this is sampling, in this case, something like a quarter of a million dimensional uh, space. And that's just the same thing, uh, the same thing again. But, um, so, yeah. and uh, I perhaps just mentioned that uh, we do, this is the uncertainty, so we do get some information inside the unobserved regions, and that's because the power spectrum uh, is uh, is part of the is part of the model, um, so we know that this uh, this patch here can't have a temperature which is wildly different from what's what's nearby. Uh, so we do get some information even when we have no data. Uh, we can get some information on the statistics, and this is where the cosmology comes in. So this is basically the amplitude of fluctuations on uh, on different scales from large scale modes to small scale, and. Uh, you get uh, uh, this essentially would tell us the, 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 the cosmology. Let me skip over these bits. Um, just uh, well, I'll just make one remark. This is this is applying it to real data. Um, so what we have is samples from both joint samples of the map and the cosmology or the cosmological parameters. If you're interested in the cosmological parameters, then you can just average over all of the maps. If you're interested in the map, then you can average over all the possible cosmologies. So the map tells you about where the dark matter is, for example. So you can do it either way and uh, get uh, either m the most probable maps of the dark matter uh, where we've uh, uh, integrated over possible cosmologies, or here where we integrate over all the possible maps and we get uh, information about the cosmology. 
So let me just finish with my last slide, apart from the conclusions, which is to just show how this works in, um, uh, in large-scale structure data, where the, the data are the um, positions of galaxies. So this is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey done by colleagues of mine. So the data consists of the observations of the positions of galaxies. Uh, you can't see it terribly well here, but there's some distribution down here. Uh, we're, we're situated here. The telescope only observed in this wedge, and it's harder to see galaxies which are far away, so there's not much data here. Most of the data is in this triangle down here. And what these are are samples of the matter distribution everywhere in this box. And I'll run the movie again, but what you should see is that in this part here, where we have uh, good data, the universe is constrained quite strongly. So the samples don't change very much from one to another. They change a bit because it's slightly noisy. Out here, where we have no data, then the possible maps will vary a lot, and those basically uh, are drawn from the, from the prior. So let me just run that again. And you can see that this part in here is quite stable. Out there it's moving around quite a lot. So that's a typical, this is, this is something like a 10 million dimensional parameter space that they've explored. And uh, it takes four months or something, I think, to get a result like that. But that, that set of samples is essentially the natural outcome, probabilistic outcome of the of the analysis of the experiment. Everything that we know is essentially in those, uh, those samples that you see there. So uh, I probably should stop, so let me just leave up my uh, conclusions and I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. So questions? Kirsten? Uh, yes, I have a question about the objective uh, Bayesian method. How much does it depend on the value of k that, you, that you use? For example, in the, in the example that you showed with the neutrinos. I have to ask you to speak ah. to the microphone so that you will be... So, so how much does it... Is it so strong? How, how much does it change with, with k? I mean, the neutrino example, for example. So, so the answer to that is, is not at all as long as k is large. So um, essentially, if, as you add in more data, then those, the posterior is, is going to get more and more Gaussian. Um, and it will evidently just get narrower and narrower. Um, so what the analysis does is to, is to um, uh, it, it, it is once you're in that asymptotic regime where it's, 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 it's Gaussian, it's looking at the width of that and how it, how it approaches zero as you add, it, add in more and more data. So as long as, you have, as long as you're in that asymptotic regime where the, uh, where the, the, uh, the, the distribution is, is close to Gaussian by the central limit theorem or by Bayesian version of it, uh, then it doesn't matter because you're, you're looking to see how it approaches, uh, a, a, how it narrows as you, as you add in more data. Um, so it matters if, uh, if for a single experiment that posterior is very far from uh, from from being Gaussian, um, so uh, but as long as you get as long as you have enough data such that it's it's looking it's it's become you know virtually Gaussian, then at that point it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And could I just uh, ask a follow-up question? Uh, is this connected with uh, the bootstrapping method? I don't think so. Because, I mean, adding data, I mean, you, so you could select basically from a data sample just a subgroup of data, uh, and, okay. uh -huh. and so in that sense, I mean. Um, I'm not sure that it does. I think it's, it's, I think what one would really like is to say, basically have k equals 1, and say I want to, I want to do this, uh, maximize the information from this one experiment. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that conceptually that's possible, but I think just, uh, it, 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 I think there are not analytic solutions unless it, unless you're in the asymptotic regime, even with one experiment. So I think the, the this is this is a tricky thing to calculate anyway. So I think it's only uh, it's only tractable if you're if, if you have uh, Gaussian posteriors. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I I don't think it would 
it would apply to do it to a bootstrapping technique because actually because the answer that, that you want is what's the information gained from the whole lot, not from a single subset of the of the, of the data, mm -hmm. unless that was your interest. If you if you uh, if you if you wanted to maximise the interest, the, the the information gained from one of your bootstrap samples, but that's not typically what one wants, is it? One wants the information yes. from the whole. Thank you. <coughs> Fascinating uh, talk. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, there, are, I have lots of questions, but I'm trying to just one, make one. You are, of course, aware of this uh, tension between CMB uh, cosmological parameters and the distance ladder from you know, Ries et al. So they are just looking at this distance, uh, um, well, essentially the distance ladder at, at with just direct optical observations of uh, supernovae and and uh, you know CFITs and these these kind of things. While uh, CMB looks at microwave wavelength across the whole sky and does this kind of super ambitious Bayesian modeling, going from theory to the observable, right? That which is uh, you know seems like a much more um, ambitious in the sense that it goes from what we think we know to the data, while the other just collects data and assembles kind of uh, goes from the data to the theory. So my question is, the, the problem with Bayesian uh, methods is always that, of course, there is this prior information, which we just don't know, or unless there's a previous experiment, right? Uh, unless there's prior information. But um, it just requires us to uh, assume uh, the, that we have a good prior. So my question is, is there, since there is this tension, so because at the end there, there's one single observable universe out there, right? And with two different ways of calculating uh, cosmological parameters, we find irreconcilable solutions at the moment, right? So there, a possible explanation in this is that there is kind of more physics there, that one of the two methods is speaking and the other is not. So my question is, given that tension, is there a way to, by changing the prior, kind of reproduce or arrive to a compatible solution with the distance ladder method, or that's completely, or has, has anyone tried this? Is this a possible um, solution, or is that not something that would work for some reason? I don't understand. Um, so, uh, uh, several comments. I, I, I think the answer is no, because uh, the Hubble parameter, the present day Hubble parameter, um, is one of the parameters in the, uh, in the CMB analysis. So one might have some scope if the parameterizations were different, mm -hmm. um, so that you could define a prior in, in one model space mm -hmm. that had some rather complicated prior in the in the other experiment space. But I don't think that's the case here because of, because as a H appears in both. Um, what I would say is that uh, with current data, it's not clear that the tension is uh, is is, is uh, definitely indicating new physics. Oh. Um, so. Generally speaking, the, the variants of the, of the Lambda CDM model, which is the standard cosmological model, involve adding in extra parameters, such as having an evolving dark energy equation at stake, or an evolving dark energy density. Um, and uh, if one looks at this from a model comparison perspective, which I haven't really talked about, and you ask, is the standard cosmological model more probable than a model with a, an extension that allows dark energy density to vary? Um, then there is a, an Occam's razor penalty that comes into that in the Bayesian evidence calculation, uh, in the model comparison calculation. Uh, that means that uh, the data have to quite significantly prefer uh, the extended model over the, the, the simpler one. Um, and the data at the moment are just transitioning between favoring significantly um, uh, or they, they, they've, they've begun to favor an extended model with, uh, with, with, with an extra parameter in it, but not conclusively. Now that evidence is getting stronger with time because the, uh, the, the, the Hubble constant measurements are getting uh, narrower in, in error bars. Uh, so it's now got to the stage where it's favored by, um, uh, you know, not, 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 a, not a compelling amount. Um, it's uh, probably up to about 10 to 1 or something. So. You wouldn't necessarily say that uh, we may have a 10% chance of having yeah. made a mistake. We're not, 
if it's one percent or something, then yeah. one can make it uh, begin to look at it seriously. Um, so we're at that interesting point where it's just beginning to be yeah. favoured, you know, to to an extent where one might uh, one might be persuaded. But I mean, a couple of other things. Firstly, that the the, the analysis of supernovae is uh, is beginning to be done in Bayesian a Bayesian way, which is a more principled way. Um, and um, secondly, the new physics might not be new cosmological physics. It could be physics of, of, of supernovae and Cephe and some of those complications. So, so where the new physics is, if this discrepancy is, to, is if it's real uh, and you need to reconcile it, then the, the new physics might be. Might be old physics. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. I was interested also interested on the priors. Um, in other fields, in astrophysics, um, uh, priors are used to constrain the models that could be acceptable. For example, um, if you are um, analyzing a um, region of star formation or a galaxy, uh, the mass cannot be higher than the dynamical mass, for example. And these constraints are used as priors in those an analyses. Are you using in cosmology something similar for the priors, or I have understood that it's not the case, right? Right, so, so uh, in some cases, yes, in that, for example, the dark matter density would have a firm lower limit of zero because we don't think that the energy density could be, could be negative. Um, there are no doubt some bizarre models of physics that would allow that. But uh, so, so there are places where uh, there is a, a, what we would consider to be a physical prior. Um, but there are, there are other parameters where there isn't really an obvious point to put a cutoff, that there isn't a sort of obvious upper limit. Um, so the Hubble parameter, for example, there's no particular reason why that can't be negative, for example, because we could have a collapsing universe. Uh, and it could be expanding. Hubble constant shouldn't necessarily I think, theoretically be bounded above. Um, so there are other ones where we don't have you know, any particularly physical reasons for, for, for putting them. So it's a bit, it's a bit of a mixture. Thanks. So thank you very much. Um, very fascinating. And I had a question perhaps on the first question on the theme of the conference, which is about evidence. And you mentioned that the probability of the data is uh, typically called the evidence. But then I have to think, because um, what, what you actually argue with, uh, or to show a certain thing, or show the value of a certain parameter, then you use, of course, the posterior, uh, the posterior which kind of, in the end, function as the evidence. If you say, well, there's evidence for uh, the fact that, that uh, a parameter has value x, then um, then you would refer to the posterior uh, or the stuff that comes out of your your analysis. So, um, so yeah, I, I my question would be, well, I'm not sure if this is something that that people think about or wh whether it, like, the, the force of the um, of the argument lies in the posterior distribution. So, would, would you wouldn't you say that part of the evidence is the whole Bayesian analysis, the, the fact that you take it? Technically referred to as the evidence, it's sometimes yeah. called the marginal likelihood in the statistics literature. Um, but that, that, that's just a technical definition. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, for most cases, we would use loosely the, the, the idea of evidence would come from the uh, from the posterior, and we would use the posterior for evidence of you know new physics or mm. yeah, absolutely yeah. Strictly, evidence is the comparison, right, between the posterior and the prior. Um, so, so, in the, the in relative the, comparison is what gives you yes, the sense that, that, of that, the that, weight of evidence. Um, ah, okay. At least that's how many philosophers tend to think of it. When okay. Yes. They Sorry. Talk of evidence. They. Um, okay. I know what you're saying. I don't know what to, what to respond to. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the uh, objective Bayesian approach. It's just a clarificatory one. Um, you mentioned something about how there's a concern that the um, priors are determined by the experiment that you're about to run 
rather than my prior knowledge. I, so could you say a little more about why, like what the nature of the concern is? Um, and does it have an influence about how you might compare results of different kinds of experiments as well, or not? I think, um, so the spirit of the first part of the talk would be, was that you have some prior knowledge that is uh, quantified by the prior. So that says what our state of knowledge is at this moment. Then you get some data and then you update your state of knowledge and you replace the prior by the posterior. Um, I think the, 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 the difficulty, if there is one, with the objective one is that uh, uh, you, you, the prior that you choose is dependent on the experiment that you're just about to mm -hmm. undertake. So in what sense is that a statement of our present state of knowledge? It's got muddy by the fact that we're about to do an experiment. Um, so that, I think, is why some people don't like it. I'm, I'm pretty agnostic on this. I, I find it interesting to do uh, in, in, in both ways. Um, and you said something else. Comparing uh, experiments, different uh, yeah, experiments. That's right. So, so um, yeah, and uh, if you take the objective Bayesian approach, then you would do, you would start with a different prior for the two different experiments. So your mm -hmm. your statement of the your state of knowledge uh, would be different in the two cases. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's. That's interesting whether that's a legitimate point of view to take. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious if you can speak to, are there any nuances involved in combining data sets on the Bayesian approach? So I'm maybe thinking it's about tensions like Bruno was mentioning or combining experiments. So um, it seems to me that data are not necessarily model independent. Uh, you know, there's a lot of assumptions that get baked into data at various points. And so um, I'm just curious about, are there, any, are there any interesting tidbits there for philosophers about, you know? Um, so the Bayesian approach is a very nice one from that point of view. Um, so one of the features is that if you, if you have two experiments and you start with a prior and you update it to the posterior with, with one experiment, and then you take that as the prior for your next experiment, and then you get your final posterior and taking into account both sets of data, then you will get the same answer as if you start with the prior and you analyze the joint data set, or you analyze the two but in the opposite order. So it's very logical from that, that perspective. Uh, in terms of the complications of the data uh, and the model dependence, that drives you towards Bayesian hierarchical models where you can include all of the effects. So it's a it's a very nice framework for, 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 for doing it um, in both respects. In fact, it gets around the problems that if you do pre-prentice analyses and combining experiments and stuff, not straightforward, but here, in fact, it is. 